Jacobs visited the campus in La Jolla and got an offer to join Booker's department. But then... He turned down the offer from UCSD uh, for about a week and then changed his mind. He and Joan went back to Boston and said, no, they're too deeply involved in things there. But then it snowed very hard that winter, and they remembered the invitation and called up to say, hey, is that still on? Uh, I'm very glad it snowed that winter in Boston. That, of course, was a very exciting time. What was one of the reasons for making the decision, and it was, it was a complicated decision back and forth, but just the opportunity to participate in founding uh, in the, well, it wasn't quite founding, but the very early days of the new school. Uh, it was two years after I came that the first undergraduate class, and most of those had come as two years uh, some from uh, transferred in from elsewhere. It was UCSD that brought Irvin and Joan to San Diego almost 40 years ago, and we were lucky to have Irvin on the engineering faculty during the university's formative years. We came here in 1966. The East campus was very small. Uh, it was kind of fun, though, in that <laughs> Being small, you helped recruit all the new faculty in all the departments. It wasn't just one department that you were involved with. When you gave courses, faculty as well as students from the various courses, other departments came in to, uh, to listen. And so it was a very nice community. It also gave us a chance to watch it grow and indeed watch it just continually improve in excellence. Jacobs recounts a fateful evening in 1966 when he and Joan were invited to the home of one of UCSD's founders. We went to a party at Harold Urey's home and um, he found out I was an electrical engineer and he pulled me to the front windows and he looked out and there were all these wires running across and he said, can't you do something about those? <laughs> I never at that time imagined that several years later <laughs> I could at least eliminate some of those wires. <laughs> so you can never tell how these things finally do close the circle. Jacobs joined the Department of Applied Electrophysics. It was clear from the start that he was interested in much more than just theory and grasped the importance of computer engineering. The department he joined had grown out of a physics orientation. It was really uh, applied physics and also space physics. And Irwin came and he knew at that point that there was a great future in computers. And he indeed developed a number of courses in computers and he, uh, including uh, laboratory courses. I've been during consulting times, learning a bit about microprocessing and the capabilities with microprocessors and different things you might do with them, decided, well, let's bring that to the, the campus, set up a laboratory uh, where we could build some hardware, electronics, and also then interface with a larger computer, program it, and be able to do all kinds of interesting things, perhaps the same kind of aspects now with the uh, phones where you, you get that and you can now put software into it, but in this case it was microcoding. Of course, a read-only memory then was a big box with, I don't know, a few hundred kilobytes at best, probably less than that. And so one had to be awfully careful in designing the code to go into it. But it, it, it really did open up lots of uh, ideas and ways to, uh, to move ahead. These courses later became central to the curriculum of, e of every EC department uh, throughout the country. But I have a feeling he had a little bit of a hard time getting them accepted uh, with this uh, department as it stood. This was the department during one of the years that Irwin was here. And some of them are still on the faculty at UCSD. Uh, it's easy to find Irwin. Um, he always stands out in a crowd. In his lab courses, Jacobs was sowing the seeds of a later career outside of academia, seizing on two central observations about the intersection of computing and communications. The courses that Irwin was introducing at UCSD became central to the success of the companies he led. I think Irwin was one of the very, very early people to understand how microprocessors can be used in engineering. There's two aspects of it that I think uh, are easily understood. One is if you build equipment that's based upon a microprocessor, you can start building the equipment before you have your system designed. 
because what you do is you build it, the, this microprocessor, which if you don't know, is just a tiny computer that's in your equipment, uh, can sit there, and then when you finally decided what you want it to do, you can load a program into it. Uh, perhaps more interesting and more important is that you can change the equipment as time progresses, and you can have the next generation simply by downloading a new program into it. And indeed, many of the products that uh, Linkabit and then Qualcomm developed were based upon this strategy, which was very new at the time. Jacobs began doing outside consulting while holding down his faculty position at UCSD, and for some of his earliest consulting work, he teamed with his old friend from JPL, Andrew Viterbi, who by then had left Pasadena for a faculty position at UCLA. Well, we did some consulting projects together, and that's really what got Link a bit started. The original office was on the uh, fringe of the UCLA campus in a very small uh, former dentist's office. We moved it down uh, to the Sorrento Valley in uh, roughly June of 1970. By 1971, Jacobs had to make a difficult decision, remain at UCSD or take over full-time running of Linkabit, which was jointly founded with Viterbi and another UCLA professor, Leonard Kleinrock. He opted for the career in industry. I don't believe that people foresaw at that point link a bit becoming so important and then becoming sold in itself and then uh, him coming back again after that and with Andy Viterbi uh, co-founding uh, Qualcomm and becoming the, the success. I think Irwin had no doubt <laughs> but I don't think the other faculty member envisioned anything like that. Irwin I believe came on full-time in 71 and I moved down things had grown so large we had all of 40 employees by 73 I felt duty-bound that I had to uh, participate more on a full-time basis as opposed to coming down once a week. Martha Dennis was an early recruit at Linkabit. It was really a family affair. Uh, one felt like um, your family belonged there because for sure Irwin's family was there. Um, uh, Irwin had his father um, employed giving out the coffee, cocoa, and chicken soup, <laughs> very important part of the, the, the diet. and. Um, he had his brother-in-law uh, running the factory, and his wife, uh, Joan, uh, would uh, cook up and dish out the hamburgers at the company picnics. Even when there were hundreds of employees, she was still doing it, which was pretty impressive. Linkabit was profitable from the first year on. And Linkabit also was able to do uh, the uh, two things in the delivery of video and data that today are multi-billion dollar businesses. And they came out of the, the group of scientists at, at Linkabit and clearly out of Irwin's leadership and many times out of his personal contribution to those things. And today the, uh, the business of scrambling uh, over the air video signals and of all those little dishes that you see around the world that that send satellite information on the sides of buildings at Linkabit uh, created that, that business. We had given them at Linkabit a contract to build to show that you could actually put a sequential decoder on a chip. And I had no doubt that they would be able to do that, but the reason I mention it is because I believe it put the notion of fabless uh, development into the psyche of all the people that we're dealing with. Jacobs and Linkabit also played a critical role in extending the precursor of the Internet across the Atlantic Ocean, putting it on the path to becoming a truly world wide web. You all know that there are many, many fathers of the Internet, more than you can count on hands and toes. Um, but Erwin played a very key role in that, and I just wanted to describe that. While he was at Linkabit, I was in the, this is a kind of a flip in roles, I was building a packet radio system. Nothing that could ever have been com commercial because these were cubic foot. They cost about $300,000 each in today's parlance. Um, not something you could ever sell. But we wanted to link the European community and Irwin volunteered to sort of organize and make a packet satellite net real. So he ran a working group that actually formed that. I, I participated, but I was sort of a member of his working group even though I was funding the activity. And my one contribution to that, other than at, at a management level, was 
doing the international tariffs. Irwin did everything else to make that technically real. We both went over together to take a tour throughout Europe, visit with all the various what were called PTTs at the time, but the telephone companies, and tell them about packet communications and why they should participate in this project. It varied with the different PTTs how long it would take before they threw us out. <laughs> Some would serve us lunch, others wouldn't even take that long. <laughs> Luckily, we did find a few research laboratories and universities that did participate. That plus the packet radio net and the ARPANET were the three components of the initial internet. So the fact that we had an internet to even experiment with is in large part due to Erwin's help on that. I think one of the troubles with the universities is they've never seen how theory and practice work hand in glove together. Uh, what I love about Irwin is the way that he's always seen this, the way that he's always done it. He doesn't talk about it, but he just naturally figures out how to take a theoretical viewpoint and use it in what he's actually doing. Linkabit was a place that really bridged the academic industry boundary, which in the 70s was still a boundary. Today, it doesn't exist, of course, but um, you were as likely to see a faculty member, say, in communications theory um, uh, in an office at Linkovit as you would see him uh, on the UCSD campus. So there was a real path back and forth. and. Linkovit was really at the forefront in creating that kind of relationship and utilizing that kind of talent as well. Linkovit grew 50% a year for 15 years and made money every year. <laughs>